What's up guys? Welcome again to another one of our LinkedIn live sessions. Uh, I'm very, very, very lucky today uh, because I've got these two dudes with me. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce you to the kind of topic and the conversation that we want to have today. Uh, and I also want to make a quick caveat as well. We only have two of these lapel microphones, so there's going to be some, some interaction and Sorry. sharing between us. Collaboration. collaboration. We're going to collaborate and share the microphone. Innovation. I hope that is. Look, ultimately, innovation normally is born out of some kind of requirement and adversity, and we're certainly understaffed in terms of the number of microphones we got. So, I don't know if you could really define it as innovation, but there's something there, probably, possibly. Um, all right. So, look, the the whole idea, as everyone who's familiar with the stream uh, knows already, or should be familiar with already. Um, is that we try to nurture and encourage a, an environment where we can share ideas, share our experiences, share our knowledge in order that we can accelerate our, our kind of collaboration skills, our communication skills and innovate to solve like problems that are actually affecting us. Um, and with that in mind, I mean, we normally talk about kind of AI and machine learning and psychology and that sort of stuff. Um, but I'm quite lucky today in that I'm being joined by, by two guys who are over from the States. It was a bit of a surprise to me as well. I got a message from uh, Emmanuel yesterday. He was like, hey man, I'm in Dubai. What are you doing? Um, and then I was like, you're coming on the stream. I think that would be really valuable. You worked out. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Um, so for, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with who my two guests are, uh, I'm joined by Dr. Emmanuel Fonbu, who is uh, a, a best-selling author uh, and obviously like a doctor, um, <laughs> like an actual real one as well, like a cardio surgeon or something. Correct. Correct. Yeah, I've, I've, I've literally no background in medicine. All I know is cardio has something to do with like the heart, the hopefully. Heart. Yeah. And then and it, it's, the some, it's somewhere here. here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, learned, I learned today that the heart is in the same place in everybody. I didn't know that before today. I learned uh, that from Emmanuel. Did, is that, that is the sum of your teaching. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that credit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I wrote a book about uh, the future of healthcare, which has got some really interesting kind of visions for, for uh, kind of where he's setting out some ideas about what that might look like in the future. Um, uh, and then I'm also uh, joined by uh, Jason Khan, uh, who's the founder of a uh, mental health startup. Would it be fair to describe it as that? Yes. So, yeah? Yes, mental health startup. In, in, in the States, that is focused on using uh, video games to understand the interactions and the behaviors of, of kids, right, in, in families, and then try and help them outside of the typical... Uh, kind of medical system or medical health care uh, support system that you have in the States, right? Is that fair? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Well, well done. Um, yeah, just trying to figure out. I come from an academic background. Here you go, bro. We've got, okay. we got, we got to share this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right. So, yeah, so I come from an academic background myself. Uh, the other kind of doctor um, as compo compared to Emmanuel. Um, the not real one. Yeah, no, the, no, the, real the real, real one. No, the, <laughs> as uh, as we do with my kids, I'm the science doctor. That's the body doctor. Yeah, uh, nice, the nice. Uh, and really, um, yeah, just observing like in an academic and a medical setting how hard it was to provide care for even the kids who could get in our doors. And so that led me to building this this company called Mightier, where we're trying to figure out ways to get to get care directly into the home. That's really nice, man. Thank you.
Right, and you explain, please, Emmanuel. Uh, what's what's your what's your thing? What's your your history? Your background? What, what's led you to where you are now? And sure. what are you doing now? Sure, sure. So my uh, background, I'm training in cardiovascular medicine, and I um, got to a point of thinking about, you know, how physicians in general spend years and years in school to educate themselves, right? And then once you finish. You literally go into a hospital or into um, a doctor's practice, and then you wait for sick patients to come in. <laughs> That's basically how it works today, um, right? <laughs> and you describe it like that. It sounds really backwards. <laughs> That's how it is, right? So yeah. we have personal trainers, nutritionists doing a fantastic job, you know, keeping people healthy. And when is your, your mic okay? Red. Your microphone is red. No, oh, my microphone is red. Yeah. What is that? Turn it off and turn it on. All right, guys, apologies. Yeah, yeah, give me your thing and you take this. Look at that. So, sorry about that. I'll just continue where we stopped off. <laughs> Technical difficulties. But, um, no, the idea here is, um, uh, so I was doing this and I uh, decided, um, you know, I wanted to do a lot more in healthcare to see how we could impact a lot more patients in general. So I joined the industry. I've worked uh, for a couple of uh, pharmaceutical companies across time and uh, working for private equity firms in between. And um, so I, that journey eventually took me into um, a startup and into a business school, right? So I'm a physician with a background in business, um, you know, as it comes to venture capital, uh, you know, advising new companies on how to get to market with products. That's kind of my background and kind of a passion for what I want to do or what I'm doing yeah, and yeah. I've been doing for several years. But it comes back to the idea of how we do medicine today, where I believe medicine has, is very reactive as the way things are today. With technology, I believe we could break down borders um, and we could make healthcare more proactive, okay. uh, where we could predict disease before it happens. And I think it's the right the time is now, and I think uh, it's time to act on that uh, to change healthcare. Cool. All right, I'm going to take this one back. Um, this is cool. Oh, we do the sharing. We can, we can this share. isn't. Yeah, this, no this line isn't working. That's All right. Cool. Cool. Okay. Um, all right. So, so, so through both of your experiences uh, in in your careers so far, what have been the biggest obstacles? Do you think in terms of getting your ideas to a point where they can actually make a difference? Yeah. I mean, I think that the the thing that I <laughs> I learned is like quickly, like science takes a long time, right? So, you have this tool, you want to make it work. Um, and you want to you know, be able to look the people in the eye who you say, like, this is going to help you. You want to be able to say, like, no, this is, this is really going to help you. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is that the scientific process is a really long one, right? So we spent, and, you know, coming from an academic medicine background, we spent, we started Mightier in 2016. We spent six years before that, like, coming up with the basic idea, going to, going to doing the clinical trial thing and trying to figure out, like, you know, is this thing really going to work? And really operating in like the randomized controlled trial type paradigm of like, okay, here's one group, here's another group that's getting like a sham version of Mightier. Okay, we've got our result. Let's go do the replication trial to make sure this thing's working because uh, in psychology there's there's a lot of issues with people replicating the results. We want to make sure we're okay on that front. Um, but that is all. That's all very very slow. And I think, you know, one of the things that we've learned over time is that that process is is great as a starting point. And I would, you know, I. I Think that I would endorse that process as a starting point. It's, it's this question of how do you move, once you have the bones in place, how do you move faster? How do you treat your, the tools that you have as more of a living thing? And how do you keep growing them over time so that you can adapt? Because you know, not every kid who comes to us is going to be exactly the same. And so we shouldn't be throwing the same exact intervention in front of them. Isn't that one of the interesting things about the, the kind of tools that you're describing, being able to personalize that experience. I think it comes back to a lot of what you're saying as well, that kind of personalized healthcare uh, mental level and a kind of physical level. Uh, that's one of the most attractive parts. For me. Oh, I think it's like, I mean, it's, it's the horizon for, for all medical care, I believe. I mean, I think that, I mean, Emmanuel said it best, I think, honestly, is that no two people are, no two people are identical. And we, we shouldn't try to treat two people the same way. And so on that front, like, yes, we all come with, we all come with a different genome, but we also all come with a different history. And so being able to respond to that and, and really build our interventions on the fly is something that is something that we can do much easier in the digital domain than we can do in the chemical domain. And it's something that makes me really excited. Cool. Thank you, man. 
And um, what about you? What, are you? what do you feel are the, the biggest kind of barriers that you've experienced to getting some of your ideas into real life? Correct. So I think the biggest barrier is everyone believing that this future of predictive medicine is like way out, right? We're talking about something 20 years from now, right? It's like it's a concept of how do you get people to understand that the technologies that we are talking about are available today, right? So if you look at uh, things like, like Netflix, for example, right? Or if you look at even like ads that we get targeted on by, on Google or on Facebook or even on LinkedIn, <laughs> right? This is all personalized based on my preferences, right? So the ads that I see are completely different from those that you see and those that you see. Um, my uh, Netflix uh, movie recommendations are completely different from yours, right? Um, and, and so is this whole concept of the technology is here today. So if you look at companies in the healthcare space um, like 23andMe or, or Nebula Genomics or other genomic companies, they are selling to consumers directly, right? Um, and th these companies basically tells you, they tell you about your, your, your genome and they tell you about the risk of having disease in the future and you have that information. And that's something consumers are buying, right? Um, but now what happens next after that? So if you know you have a risk for a particular disease, so then what, right? How do you personalize that experience? I think that's where healthcare is going. Well, we need to stop having this mindset of having this one size fits all uh, kind of concept into that personalized approach, right? Which is very similar to what Searchy does, right? And we talked about Searchy today, where you know you can't just hire anyone in general, right? Uh, is that, is this person the right person for that for that job or the right person for this particular company? That's the concept where we go into this individualized mindset where everyone is a unique individual and there's no one size fits all, right? And to do that, we need data to, to drive that. All right, so from your side is the scientific research. The, the length and the time that it takes to do the research, that's been a big barrier that you've experienced. Yeah, I mean, I think that it is. And I think, you know, it's a, it's, it's a valuable barrier, right? You don't, want, you don't want to flood the world with a bunch of, especially when it gets into health, you don't want to flood the world with a bunch of tools that are, are just meaningless or empty and have no, have no <laughs> promise. Have, have, have no equity. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and so that process, that process is incredibly valuable. And I think that it comes with a lot of, you know, it comes with a lot of ceremony that is, is important. So we, we work really hard to protect our patients. We work really hard to protect, you know, their privacy, their security. This is, this is, this is vital, right? Um, but that also comes with a flip side, which is that then you end up building these trials um, that target, you know, you build, they're called inclusion criteria, but you, you, you include one type of person, right? So you, you, you can put this little box, these are the people that are eligible, yeah. and like, you know, this is the world of people that are, <laughs> <laughs> that are, that can be helped. And so it's, you know, okay, so I know how to, I, how, I know how to make it work in this little tiny box. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, it's sort of, we dance around this conversation, but, you know, the product people and the marketing people, the people who are making LinkedIn, like they have the methods, like all these things, like, okay, so you make it work in a little box, like, what are the like 10,000 experiments I need to do to yeah. make it work in the big box? And those, those methods exist. And I think for us, I think there's a real trick in figuring out like, how do you make that become part of medicine? How do you make that so that we can run really something that's post, that's, I'm going to jump into medical jargon, but like post RCT, randomized controlled trial, like what happens after that? So that your, your tool isn't just validated and available to this tiny, you know, that tiny little group of people, but it's something that's truly available to the wide group of people who could benefit. Because that's, that's, I think, one of the, the, the challenges that we face to some extent as well is that, that kind of proving the validity of the thing and the length of time that it takes to produce that and the methods that are currently accepted by the community in order to do that. You know, you mentioned, you know, the, the big marketing giants that are out there, they, they, they're already running these tests. And Netflix, to your point about Netflix earlier, just, just open sourced uh, tool that they've been working on. I think it's called Pi Notes uh, or something similar, um, where it's, it's basically like a, a library where you can run all of these tests at, simultaneously and, and understand very quickly what tests are running, what results you're getting from them. And I, I don't know, I mean, my exposure to the kind of medical research uh, uh, kind of industry is, is literally zero, right? But I, I'm getting the flavor from what you guys are describing that that's still a problem. And certainly from our side, when we're trying to get product validated by, uh, not by the market, because we're getting that, but when we're trying to get it validated by some kind of research organization, which is recognized um, and, and difficult to refute, you know, we, we, we struggled with that. 
Um, we had a discussion earlier yes. about this, right? Uh, we, like this, this morning, uh, <laughs> we're talking, and the idea was the days of uh, randomized controlled trials are those days over, I mean, it, which is the conversation we have, because I think from, from research, you have to continuously learn, right? Yeah. So if you look at uh, some of the companies that have the, the most amazing algorithms, right? Uh, like Searchy, of course, right? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 correct. <laughs> right. And, and you, look at, you look at Google and you look at uh, the Facebooks and the Netflix, they don't have trials broken down into, you know, you know this is a randomized control trial to show that it works, right? It's a continuous learning process. And that's how humans learn, right? Um, that's how kids learn. Uh, if you learn to ride a bike, you learn over time. And as you get better, they keep riding. The more you ride, the better you get. Um, that's the mindset we need to have, I, I think, going forward. Um, in, in medicine, we call that real-world evidence kind of trials or pragmatic trials, uh, where it's basically conducting research in the real world that are not powered by the p-value, right? So when you get more scientific about it, uh, then it becomes a little bit ridiculous sometimes the way we do, we do things, right? So we design this perfect world uh, because we have to control variables to hit a certain probability. Um, Facebook doesn't need to do that to, to prove that it works, right? Um, and we had this discussion earlier uh, about my tier, for example, right? If the go-to-market strategy was, do you want to go to the market as, uh, you know, as a prescription product, you know, defined by the scientific community, or uh, how much value to get out of that, or do you want to go direct to the consumer? Um, the idea is, do you, do you bring benefit? Benefit to the user. I think that's the overall goal of this, right? And if you bring the overall value to the consumer, the consumer knows because you know exactly how good it is, right? It got to a point where if you put a Google search, for example, for cat, for example, and Google shows you a cat and one dog, and then you say, no, that's a cat, that's a dog, not a cat, the argument gets better. So it's one of those things where instead of looking for this one-off proof kind of thing, we have this mindset of continuous learning and have algorithms that get better, and that's the whole concept behind machine learning. Right? I mean, don't you agree uh, with my dear? Yeah, I mean, I mean, absolutely in the context of my dear and in the broader context of medicine as well. I mean, I think that, I mean, everybody deserves to be able to walk in to whatever care they're getting and have care that is built for them. And I think that that is a, that is a, that is a threshold that we need to cross, like across medicine in general. And I, I think one of the things that's fun is that in the in the sort of the mental health and mental wellness places, we're going to be one of the places. Uh, this is unusual for us, but we're going to be one of the places where we can lead. Um, and the sense that, you know, when you when you go invest in a in a in a chemical or doing basic drug discovery, like you're going to build that thing, and it's going to be you're going to make it. It's going to be fixed, and you're going to go through this process because you want to make sure it's safe, and you want to make sure it's you know all these pieces that go through. Um, I think that when it comes to sort of these digital interventions, we we sort of know from a, I and mean, we wouldn't, you know, you can't completely take it for granted, but the, the idea of safety is one, like, you know, it's a, we accept that many of these interventions are just safe. Um, and then even within the context of how you build that. So then once you have this, you know, this basic framework of what safety is, then yes, it's easier to just start playing. Like you get thousands and thousands and thousands of levers and you just sort of play with them, right? Like you say, okay, we'll fill this for this for this. And I think that that leads to a position where, you know, over time, the entire intervention gets stronger. And every single person who comes to the intervention is one that's going to make it better. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that's exciting. So you know, as you walk in as a consumer, like, hey, you're getting the best version of this thing as it exists today. But you're just straight out using it means the person who's going to come after you is going to give you an even better version. Better give it, yeah, that's mm. very attractive. Yes, <laughs> correct. And that's, I think I think Basil brought up a, a great point. Yes, I, I agree with you. I I think um, that's where we're going. Um, innovation in healthcare will be great if the lifestyle of the patients improved. That's certainly true. And and what I argue for is this formula called value equals outcomes divided by cost. Right overall. Right so. I sucked at math um, in, in school, so I'm not trying to make it complicated, but just know if you divide it by cost, if the cost goes down, value goes up, right? If outcomes goes up, um, the value goes up. That, that's the overall concept. So you want to decrease cost or reduce cost, as you mentioned, and in terms of value. So that's like the, the, the foundation of any innovation around healthcare to bring value to everyone. Um, and I think that's where we're going in, in, in industry. So, And I don't think this is something that should be solely for, 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 for people with doctorate degrees in medicine, right? Yeah. Because, because everyone has a body and everyone is involved in healthcare, right? 
the, the, the goal would be how do we get the average person to understand what exactly it is that we do, right? In simple terms, that does not include sophisticated, um, you know, uh, statistical analysis kind of things, for, but make you understand what value is to you, right? And not based on the technology, but what is the value to you? So I kind of, I, I want to dig into that a little bit, mate, and I almost might take you to task a little bit. So the, at a kind of philosophical level, yeah, sure. But you guys are both based in the States. Mm -hmm. And the healthcare industry in America is notoriously poor. Uh, not not wealth-wise, but in terms of the, 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 the value that it provides to the consumers and its capacity to cater for a wide kind of breadth of people. Um, and, I mean, obviously, I am not based there. I am based here. Um, but the, the flavor that I get from from what I read uh, and what I watch is that the innovation in healthcare is governed fundamentally by profit before value for consumers. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> it's I'm a, sorry, yeah. I couldn't help it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. I think that it... I'm not 100%. I, I, I understand the premise of the question, right? So... In the States, payment for healthcare is a very bizarre thing that I could I couldn't start to explain it to an outsider because I don't understand it myself, right? So the um, but I think what this leads to is this position where, you know, the the next wave of what healthcare is is just going to be like there's going to be like the payers are gonna have their set of their set of business models. And that's, you know, I mean, that is what it is. But I think what you're going to see, and I think this is true of Mightier and many, many other companies in the space, is that there's just a need to figure out other ways of reaching consumers and other ways of providing value to consumers. Mm. So, you know, I mean, you, you ask, like, how do you know what the value is to a customer, like a consumer? Like, in our case, we just ask them, like, why, why are you here? Like, what's important to you? Um, and I think that, you know, I think that the states are for all its weirdness in the like t in sort of how healthcare is driven there's also i think that that sort of weird constraint also builds an environment where people are happy to sort of play with other ways of imagining the system and i think you know hopefully maybe i'm being a little optimistic about the states but like you know hopefully that leads to new models coming up over time and we we find ways to to better reach people i mean so i'm i'm fairly familiar with like the fintech industry here and i understand in some depth not in depth but in some depth the kind of constraints that those uh those fintech companies those early stage kind of challenger banks experience uh but it's never really been like the med tech industry has never really been on my on my radar in in that same kind of through that same kind of lens of kind of the limitations and i don't know if based on your experience Previously, um, um, like what, 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 what were the things that would kind of govern the work that you were doing in your previous capacity and, and kind of lead you in a, in a specific direction versus a different one? And obviously, as a larger player, it would have, I'm imagining it would have been more easy for you to navigate through some of that kind of uh, that kind of compliance red tape. Correct. So, I mean, we, I mean, when you when you travel around the world and you go to different conferences and, and like the discussions around this, right? And it's a lot of times it's not because it's a conference, it's because you want to meet like-minded individuals and, and have a conversation and get inspired by what's happening globally, right? And I was in Rwanda, for example, um, in East Africa several months ago, and there was a future of tech discussion. And it was like the med tech booth was like around the corner, like very small, right? Uh, even in Dubai, last month I was in Dubai, <laughs> right? If you walked around um, during the AI everything conference, for example. You mean uh, the one where you dodged me, huh? Yeah, that one. Office, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now we're here together. So it worked out. It worked out. Uh, yeah, correct. Now he invited me to dinner. I, I, I couldn't make it to the dinner. So he went with my neighbor instead. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, but if you look at it, the healthcare section is always small because, and the reason is 
People don't understand how to uh, quantify the return on investment in medtech, right? Um, which I think would be great for you to actually share your, your business model because we talked about this before. And, and the question is, would the consumer actually pay um, for like an app, for example, right, um, that prevents them from having a particular disease? Or would they pay for uh, an app that is more, you know, like like prevention or management of disease that doesn't come directly to the insurance? It's very different. You mentioned the U.S. healthcare system in general. It's one in which people get access to insurance basically through employment, majority of people, right? Yeah, so, you, yeah, so, so if you don't have a job, for example, then you basically cut off of the system, right? Yeah. And then there are people that have maybe jobs that don't ha provide insurance to them. How do you keep those people engaged, right? And, and so is prevent, pre preventive medicine more beneficial and, and more valuable to, you know, in that patient population or, or that consumer population or not? And so I think Marty, because we had this discussion this morning um, by the nice pool in Dubai, <laughs> right, about what are you experiencing from that side, right? I mean, do you think a consumer will actually pay for this, uh, right, or pay for prevention, which I think is a great business model because I think, especially in the, in the med tech space, people believe that you have to go directly to some of the key stakeholders like the payers or the pharma companies or the health systems to actually cover this, right? But what's your experience with consumers directly paying for this? Yeah, so maybe so a sort of like, yeah, you don't know, just don't worry about the bike. Like maybe just for the benefit of those watching, like just talk about what our business model is. So Mightier is sold, there's a $99 upfront fee. And then customers go into one of two, they choose one of two plans. So there's a $20 a month plan where you get, um, you know, you get a, you need a heart rate band to play, so you get the equipment. And then you get a uh, introductory is call. It a pinbit, or is it just... It's a it's a cuss. It's a it's a it's a heart rate band. It's yeah. a it is it's a mightier band, but it it works. It essentially works like a Fitbit. You wear it on your arm. Um, and then there's a there's a thirty five dollar a month plan um, where you um, excuse me where you where you pay the plan, and then we send you we actually send you a custom mightier tablet, and then you get a once a month call with a with a dedicated social worker coach, and so. You know, between those two plans, like, yes, what we're finding is that people are very happily signing up. Um, I think, you know, we, we do get the question of, is this, is this insurance reimbursable? But I think that we have asked in the U.S. system for consumers to take on their own, and this, you know, my, my perspective becomes very narrow on the mental health space, but we've asked consumers to really take on their own mental health, their own mental health wellness and treatment, which is you know, perhaps not necessarily ideal as how we want to build a system, but I mean, I think it's the reality. We have a lot of people waiting in line. Mental health access is, um, I mean, people don't even know, but it's probably like one of the defining problems in terms of global mental health, or not global, but global health period. I think that there's, there's a massive shortage of providers. Um, I think depression is the number one cause of, of disability worldwide period. Um, so, you know, you have this invisible problem that Unless a, unless a consumer just takes it on for themselves, uh, you, they're not going to get help. And so consumers, you know, they come, they they have this motivation, they want the best for their children. And I think that if other people prop up with, come up with business models where they go straight to an adult or geriatric population, yes, you still want the same. You want the best for yourself or your parents um, as well. And I don't know. I mean, I think that. Yes, it's tempting to say, like, yes, from a policy point of view, we want to push all the insurers to take a long view of life and, you know, have interest in, like, the lifelong view of what a child is. I think, though, if you start as that starting point of, like, hey, I'm just going to change how the system works, like, you're never going to get anything done. So you just have to think, like, how am I going to work with how things work, get product out there, and then learn from that and go. I think that you raise a, an interesting an interesting point there as well about the you know if you if you start off with the attitude like from an entrepreneurship perspective here right if you start off with the attitude of I'm just going to fundamentally change the way that everything is done it is maddening because it's it's such a big I mean it's, maybe it's a noble objective something that you really want to achieve and that really means something like in in, in medicine as well, I feel like with what we're doing where we're trying to make people happier at work by finding them stuff that they genuinely enjoy doing with people they genuinely enjoy being around, you know, those feel like noble causes, but then 
if you approach that problem from everything that happens right now today is wrong and I am now answering my calling by then trying to disrupt this entire industry, you end up with your own new mental health problems. <laughs> you know, Anyone that's yeah, watching this, <laughs> uh, you just spawn new ones. Um, but so anyone that's watching this in an entrepreneurship or considering a step into entrepreneurship, you know, try and approach it from a, a kind of bottom up approach where you're tackling little bits of the problem at first and then you scale from there. You can't just jump into to changing an industry entirely. Um, what else have you been up to, man? In the last, was it been six months since you were here last? Yes. So what else have you been up to? Well, since the last six months, um, on a personal level, I decided to um, back on the concept of predictive medicine. I know you're gone. <laughs> but I, I decided to actually get my whole genome sequenced based on this whole concept, right? Um, because um, I had this, this belief on this concept of, you know, we can prevent disease, and I did a lot of talking about it. And so the idea was, how do I make it actionable, right? So I actually got my genome sequenced. And I learned a couple of things, which I will be sharing a lot more um, down the road, like going through the whole genome uh, sequencing piece. But I found out, for example, that I had a high gene, a high risk for hypertension. Right? My grandmother had hypertension, um, like in, you know, from a family perspective. I, I don't have hypertension today, so there are two things I could do. One is do absolutely nothing and get hypertension down the road, or I could be more active today, um, and then. Um, you know, try to change lifestyle kind of things to see how that influences health, right? Um, I also found out that I have a gene that makes me able to smell asparagus in urine. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm glad that you use this new technology to discover... No, no correct. So, so, no, correct. So, so um, that is a special skill set, apparently. Um, yeah. Something I learned about myself, right? So I should stay away from asparagus or stay away from people <laughs> that eat asparagus yeah, yeah, yeah. in the bathroom, clearly. <laughs> right? So, so that's something I found about myself. And, and so what I've been doing is then saying, uh, now I know the risk of what's going to happen um, in an event, right? So then... How does that influence my lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. um, what happens if I drink less wine or I eat less meat or I get more active, right? Mm -hmm. how, how does that influence things in my life? And, and to me personally, I'm interested in, uh, you know, having people understand the value of understanding uh, what lies ahead for you in terms of uh, in terms of disease and how to manage it. I don't think uh, having a risk, for example, for Alzheimer's means you're going to have Alzheimer's, right? I mean, we have tons of publications today, uh, like recently, actually yesterday, that, that talked about how... Uh, how much if, how much you sleep actually influences your risk of having Alzheimer's, right? But today, what do we do? We wait for patients to get Alzheimer's, then we give them drugs to see what happens, right? Is it much better if we actually start doing research way earlier in disease, right, to prevent Alzheimer's from happening, right, and wait till people get Alzheimer's? The same thing ap applies to Parkinson's. The same thing applies to, you know, to diabetes and hypertension down the road. So I think having everyone, all of us, um, you know, have this baseline piece and look at life as life is a story, and your genes are just the beginning or the foundation of it, but it doesn't mean you're doomed. Just because you have a risk for breast cancer doesn't mean you have to wait to get breast cancer. Just because you have a risk for you know, having schizophrenia doesn't mean there's nothing else you can do about it, right? Uh, the, the people that have genetic risk for depression, for example, right? Uh, don't you want to know and don't you want to like, control that and have some kind of influence over it? Why just wait to get disease? Uh, so that has been something I've been very proactive about um, recently. Um, and whether that comes from, you know, from a venture uh, side of it or investment uh, side of it, that's something I'm, I'm trying to pursue and make sure that we could influence the world and change the world in that direction to get everyone to become more proactive about healthcare, right? And not let the doctors sit with, in a control arm, right? To open it up for healthcare, make everyone participate. And if people need a drug, for example, yes, yeah, get the right drug to the right patient, uh, get the right patients in the right trials. Those are things that are relevant to us, right? Um, and so that, and I'm, that's why I'm, very happy to meet, you know, uh, people walking to solve problems like, like you know, like through my, what my tears doing, for example, right? That's very interesting work that, it, that is personalized for a particular patient population, right? Uh, young people play video games, right? Yes. So why not leverage that to bring better outcomes to make it more engaging yes. and more fun to change things, right? So that, that's an innovative approach on how to do things. Um, you know, even what surgery is doing, for example, right, in terms of recruitment, right, that is groundbreaking and innovative way of thinking. So people think differently and think outside the box. That's how we could solve these problems, right? Because if we all think differently in our different industries, I think um, everyone gets along with this mission, and I think we have better outcomes down the road. So that's been a great mission of what I've been on. So 
speaking of mission and recruitment, um, <laughs> what what? So it's 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 nice to to kind of believe that if we can find people that buy into the mission, then they're going to kind of buy into the team and they're going to help to to progress us forward, right? But and you're twenty people nowish, yeah, you said. Just under. Um, so, what have been some of those challenges that you've experienced with, you know, either identifying if someone is actually legitimately on board with the mission, or or kind of those interpersonal behaviours that you need to to watch for? How do you, how do you deal with that in in your business? Yeah, I mean, I think the recruiting for a startup is always it's 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 an adventure and it's a challenge for for sure, and I'm not. I'm not 100% sure that we've got it right. I, I, it's, it's, it's exciting, same. right? Well, I mean, this is like, yeah. It's, it's, it's the same with everything. It's right. an ongoing yeah. thing, right? It's What's really right ongoing. today isn't right yes. tomorrow. There are different stages and horses for courses. Do you have that expression in America, horses for courses? Uh, no, but I'm Swings sure we have. roundabouts, have you heard that one? No, because we have rotaries. <laughs> <laughs> um, the... Uh, <laughs> All right, one of my favorite shows is Only Fools and Horses. Yeah, yeah, of course, that's the one. A Del Boy, yeah, man. Yeah. Like everyone in the UK, that's a rite of passage, mate. It's a rite of passage. <laughs> um. Yeah, so the recruitment. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we haven't. I, and, um, you know, I'm trying to come up with some, like, you know, uniquely American idiom here, but I'm, I'm, my words are failing me. So the... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm the uh, pressure on <laughs> the um, do it <laughs> right. You know, think on your feet. Not my. You know, we'll figure it out eventually. Um, the uh, you know, I think that there's when with a place like my dear, I think it's it's very easy to get candidates in the door because they become very excited about the about the mission. And so it's not let's come up with a different way to sell ads. It's not a way with you know let's come up with a new financial transaction. It's it's something where hey, we want to bring mental health care to children everywhere. Like that's a very easy, that's a very easy mission to sell. But I think that then when it comes down to it of like, all right, like there's the mission piece and then there's like, there's a layer beyond, which is like, what is the culture of Mighty? Are you going to fit in with that, with, with that particular culture? Are you going to be able to thrive? Because, you know, when you're, when you're as small as we are, the missing on recruitment is, is a big problem. And so, you know, finding that and like honestly, like getting introduced to like tools that like can help us figure that out is is vital. Like we can't we can't afford to miss. Like we have, you know, I mean, you know, the startup world. We we work on an eighteen month runway, and if if we <laughs> if we <laughs> yes if if we if we miss, then we're blowing a third of that, and you know, then you've got like you know the next twelve months to try to you know the next person has got a the next person has not only got to. Uh, you know, they've not only got to achieve at the level that you you brought in the original person for, but they've got to like make up for that lost time, yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. it's a very hard problem. Yeah. So basically, yeah, you need help. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone does. Who's okay? Sahika Bennett. <laughs> Hi Sykes. Um, Okay, so I'm guessing that this is a question for me. Um, what are my thoughts about uh, AI and healthcare? Uh, so I'm going to defer. <laughs> so I, uh, I think AI has a, a huge role to play in healthcare. So I'll give a couple of examples. Um, one is around uh, clinical decision support, right? Um, so tons and tons of... Uh, of clinical research is being published on a daily basis, right? Even basic research, right? And the average clinician or the average human uh, doesn't have the time to read every single information that's out there to actually make a decision, <laughs> right? Um, what is the best decision for every single person, right? Based on the latest evidence, right? So, and that's one. Two, clinicians um, uh, might not be familiar with updated guidelines on how to manage particular conditions. And so what you can do is uh, with artificial intelligence today, you could actually use natural language processing to actually understand clinicians' notes within the EHR system, which is electronic medical records, like doctor's notes, basically, and then look at also with the evidence that's currently available and then determine what is the best treatment for that particular patient at the point of care, right? So I see a massive impact around that, um, coming around that to influence behavior to make sure all patients are treated um, on, a fair, on a fair standard. That's, that's one. Two... I see artificial intelligence playing a massive role in the idea of predictive medicine. 
So recently, if you heard about the Apple Watch, for example, the Apple Watch is able to predict the risk of someone having atrial fibrillation uh, or having irregular heartbeats, right? Or if someone falls, for example, um, that you could get an alert about, about such things. That's another great area. You will see this not only in the idea of wearables, um, but voice as well is becoming a great um, a biomarker for prediction of disease. Yeah. Uh, there are companies that are working on, you know, using voice to predict Alzheimer's. Uh, they're using voice to predict uh, dementia, voice to predict, um, you know, depression, suicide. And um, there are many companies working on this, right? A lot of data on, on this uh, on this thing. So you see some key areas on that. Um, even, even from the point of making us more proactive and more reactive about disease in general, right? Um, like I said, when I say healthcare, I want us to think about wellness as well, not just sick care, right? Um, Today, I think it's very standard to hear people talk about, uh, if I say, let's go walking, for example, right? And you say, hey, um, oh, let me let me get my step counts going, <laughs> right? Just like data sets that we, we actually capture now that w wasn't the case before, right? Using these kind of data sets, we could actually understand a lot more about disease. Uh, with that being said, I think one of the biggest gaps today in medicine is that question of what actually leads to disease, right? We don't know that, no, right? What's actually predictive? Yeah, well, it's a disease, correct. So if I had diabetes and you had diabetes, for example, was the cause of my diabetes and yours the same, right? Was yours genetic or was mine the fact that I just tanked, you know, a bunch of sodas last night or, or, or for the last 20 years I've been drinking sodas, right? Clearly, because I'm 21, so that's why I said 20 years. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I know, today, today we, we had an MIT uh, review meeting today and I saw the sign that says... Um, uh, 35 under 35, and uh, I couldn't even take a picture next to it because <laughs> so I had to move around. But right, but the idea is, to me, the biggest gap in, in knowledge in medicine today is actually understanding what leads to disease. That's, that'll be the biggest impact of, of artificial intelligence in healthcare. That's why I advocate for having this baseline piece from genomics, for example, and collecting data sets over time to say, hey, if you are you know, schizophrenic or depressed, was it caused by your genetic? Was it caused by environmental factors, right? For example, we know for, that uh, if you live in a, uh, a cloudy place like Boston, right, uh, you have a high tendency to be more depressed than if you live in a sunny place like Dubai or Hawaii. Right, so does this is what I mean. Over this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, correct. No, correct. So thanks, thanks to Tom Brady, yeah, and thanks to the Red Sox and everyone else, right? <laughs> the Boston folks. Yeah, um, yeah they get to be happy. But I mean, there's data stats around this, right? So you could say, hey, I'm depressed because I'm in a cloudy place. I mean, I live in New York, so you could say, okay, cloudy place like New York, or do I need to move to a warm place like Dubai, for example, right? Is that the right environment for you, right? What makes and this influences a lot more about how people live around the world, right? So you live in a place cold, uh, like the UK. Actually, talking about weather, I, I see it. Like the UK, for example, right? Uh, it's cloudy quite a bit, right? And you could say, oh, do I want to move to Dubai? Right? Is it a better lifestyle for you? Are you happier in Dubai? Yeah, every time I see you in Dubai, you're smiling. And that's why you're here, so, right? So, so there, there are a lot of things that data can do and people can learn from, right? And someone else in the UK or someone else in New York could say, hey, Look at people that live in Dubai, look at people that live in Hawaii, uh, maybe they feel happier during a certain amount of time, right? And then, um, thanks for agreeing, Saika, you see? <laughs> we got a buy in here, you see? So thank you, I'm glad I asked. That means, that means question answered. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I feel lucky because I agree as well. Um, all right, look, uh, we've been going for a little while, we've been going for 50 minutes, and I fully intend to continue this conversation later with both of you. But... I would be doing a disservice if I did not take the opportunity while you're here to ask you about um, gene editing, especially as you've gone on a fair amount. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, mate. And it may be a bit cliche in your circuit. You may experience a lot of those sorts of questions. But I'm, I'm obviously fairly uh, kind of layman. Um, but I actually have a vested interest in asking. Um, so my eldest son has a genetic disorder called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is, uh, which is, you know, congenital. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, it's an area that I, I, to my shame, don't know enough about considering my interest in it, uh, and the reasons for my interest in it. Um, but I am interested as, as, some people who obviously will know a lot more about this than I do. What is what is your take on where we are with gene editing today? Does it show the promise that it kind of alludes to? And what are the, 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 the kind of considerations that we need to have when we're experimenting with this kind of technology? Who wants to take it? I'm guessing. Oh, yes, yes, let them take that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, 
that's actually very interesting because on my way here to Dubai, I was in Jerusalem, um, and I was. Whoa! I know. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and and and, um, and I was there for a conference called. I mean, for a meeting. It was a conference. It was like a small gathering. Uh, it's called the the, the uh, Jerusalem Ethics Forum. And uh, we had a lot of experts um, in the gene editing space, all right? They talk about CRISPR technology, yeah. which everyone, everyone is going. And there's a new one as well, right? like an enhancement on CRISPR. Right? CRISPR, correct. And it's so where experts are there. And the, and the idea is, uh, you know, like humans, if you watch a movie Gattaca, for example, where you have the, you know, the AGTC, right. correct, like the gene piece of it. And it's been known over some time now that, you know, certain uh, missed pairs of genes could actually lead to certain conditions, right, over time, right? Which is nothing you could do about it. And the idea is, can you then go in and then cut that piece out yeah. of the gene um, and then replace it or, or, just, or just splice it out so you don't have that particular condition? I think that's the most promising thing in medicine uh, going forward because you could definitely influence life in a massive manner, right? Uh, you know, if, if you look at in a case of like congenital adrenal hyperplasia or you look at type 1 diabetes, for example, right? The influence of a lot of these conditions that you could actually improve a lot of things on, it's mind-boggling, right? Um, if, if, even from Alzheimer's, for example, the different condition, we you know like uh, trisomy 21, it's a specific, particular gene uh, or particular part of a gene that actually leads to a particular disease. Can you splice that out and then improve disease over time? Uh, that's definitely magical, right, in, in terms of medicine. And I think this will be groundbreaking in the future. When I say future, I'm not talking distant, like 100 years from now. No, I'm talking about like a recent future. Like 10 years. Yeah, correct. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah. It's not correct, so like in a much distant future. Uh, I think the challenge now is when you go in to edit those, those genes, how do you target a specific gene to make sure you don't influence other genes around it, right? Yeah. So, which I, I think people are working on. A lot of research coming out of MIT, um, looking at this, um, on how you could specifically target a specific gene that you want to influence um, to have behavior. The question also go, becomes, uh, what if uh, a mother is pregnant, for example, and she finds out from, right, um, about this particular gene? Um, what if you go in and edit the gene? Um, what happens to those humans down the road, right? Um, and what happens to your kids ne next of kin, right? Is there a bigger impact on your genes? Like the gene drive from right? No, correct. Yeah. Exactly. And then another piece of it is understand a lot more also if you then take out that gene, do you then trigger, you know, some tumor to grow down the road that we don't know yet, right? Um, so a lot of those research work is being done, but I, I think um, it's definitely the most promising thing in medicine um, uh, going forward. I think um, the researchers around this would definitely win the Nobel Prize in medicine. Um, and, and so I should keep an eye on this, but I think it's very, very promising um, for, for everyone. Good. Cool. Cool. And yeah, I mean, let's have the ethical conversations later offline because uh, <laughs> that requires more colorful language than I think we're allowed That's to use. And probably. <laughs> okay. All right, guys, look, um, everyone that's tuned in, thank you very much. Um, as usual, the, the whole idea of, of, of what we're doing here with the live stream is to try and encourage as much knowledge transfer, as much knowledge share as possible. Um, and we are looking for people who are interested in sharing their experiences with us here on the stream, with our audience. Um, all of the videos get kept as well and they, they're, they're saved to LinkedIn so that anyone can come and access them at any time just by accessing the channel. Um, so if you feel like you have something that you wish to contribute that you think that would be important for the community to hear so as that we can start sharing and getting better at communicating all of these ideas instead of kind of siloing ourselves off because we think that we're unique, we're not, there are lots of us. Uh, we just need to be more vocal uh, so as we improve our reach and we can actually make a meaningful difference at scale. Um, so if you're interested, please feel free to join uh, or to reach out to us and ask how you can get involved. Um, thank you to both Emmanuel and Jason for joining me. Um, Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you. And, and I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to have you here, guys. Um, so, yeah, for everyone else, thank you very much. Take it easy, and we'll catch you next Tuesday. Bye. Bye. Bye.